this has just indicated to you that we are recording this this session and i hope you are all very comfortable with it in the interest of time i'm going to do my opening remarks after master chava sifularo shall have introduced uh, our speaker simply because uh, as a journalist she's chasing after a very tight deadline and she's supposed to leave us by quarter past 10 latest. So I will then hand over to you, Master Chaba. Thank you, Saul. I seem to be having trouble with my audio. I, I'm not hearing you anymore and I'm not sure if everyone is able to hear me. Yes, yes we can I hear am. you loud and clear. Yeah. You're audible. Okay, I'm reading your lips and I am hearing you say, well, I'm, I'm figuring you saying that you can hear me loud and clear. Yes. So I'll, I'll just go on. I'll, I'll continue um, with this honor of introducing uh, Pietro Scalia. Um, following the success of Ridley Scott's The Martian in 2015, which earned Scalia the ACE and BAFTA nominations, he joined Scott for Alien Covenant, their 11th film together, released in May 2017. Since then, he has edited Han Solo, a Star Wars story with Ron Howard, and is presently in post-production of Morbius, directed by Daniel Espinosa, to be released in the fall of 2021. Are we still okay? Yes. Great. This is a beautiful profile, by the way. Pietro Scalia is a two-time Academy Award winner. For 30 years, Scalia has been an integral collaborator on films from prolific and acclaimed directors such as Ridley Scott, Oliver Stone, Bernardo Bertolucci, Gaston Sand, Rob Marshall, Sam uh, Raimi, and Ron Howard. Scalia began his career as an assistant editor for Oliver Stone's Wall Street and Talk Radio then went on to contribute as an associate editor on Born on the 4th of July and as an additional editor on The Doors. In 1992, the 31 year old Scalia won his first Academy Award for best editing on Stone's JFK, as well as uh, an ACE and the BAFTA Awards. In 1998, Scalia received his second Ac uh, Academy Award nomination for Gaston Sands Goodwill Hunting. He went on to edit G.I. Jane, Hannibal, Gladiator, Black Hawk Down, and American Gangster for director Ridley Scott, garnering another Academy Award nomination on Gladiator and winning his second Academy Award for his work on Black Hawk Down. After editing Body of Lies, Robin Hood, Prometheus, the counselor for Scott, Scalia com completed uh, The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 for Mark Webb. Other editing credits include Little Buddha and Stealing Beauty for Bernardo Bertolucci. The Quick and the Dead for Sam Raimi, Playing by Heart for Willard Carroll, Memoirs of a Geisha for Rob Marshall and Kick-Ass for Matthew Vaughan. He has also edited documentaries such as 40 Years of Silence, An Indonesian Tragedy, The 11th Hour and Ashes and Snow. In addition, Scalia, if Scalia's efforts, um, in addition, Scalia's efforts include stints as mu music producer with composer Hans Zimmer on three of Scott's films, and served as a jury member at the Venus uh, Film Festival in 2004 and in Zurich Film Festival in 2012. The Italian-born Scalia was raised and educated in Switzerland before moving to the United States to pursue filmmaking receiving his Master of Fine Arts in Film and Theater Arts from the UCLA in 1985. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. We can't hear you, uh, Sol. I can. Thank you very much, um, Master yeah. Chava. Uh, for, for the introduction of, of Pietro. And let me formally welcome all of you um, to this event. Um, for me, uh, the past few days that I spent with, with Pietro 
have taken me back to 1996, 1997, when I was a drama student at VETS. And post that, um, I have been living and eating uh, movies. And it was quite a privilege for me that ultimately I, I met uh, Pietro in person. And in fact, I indicated to him that in fact, I, I watched Black Hot down more than 20 times. And, and after he sent me his, his biography and I've also uh, consulted with Uncle Google, I then also realized that in fact, um, he didn't only die, uh, uh, edit um, Block Out Down, uh, Jeff K that I knew, uh, he also edited amongst others, my most favorite movie, um, um, Goodwill Hunting, uh, because in some of my presentations previously, I've also made reference uh, to the Madillion character. Uh, for me in South Africa of late, we are referring to such character as an, an organic intellectual. That is someone who's not necessarily um, possessing any academic qualifications, but the person is extremely talented uh, he's an intellectual, he talks sense all the time. And I said to Roberto, I've watched it more than 10 times, but I'll be too embarrassed to tell Pietro about this. <laughs> so today it isn't about me, but it is about Pietro. And I'm now going hand to hand over to him and he will tell us all about editing. And may I request that um, you mute your your, your, your mics, even if you can leave the video on, I'm comfortable with that. And along the way, uh, we are going to take questions, but those who may not feel comfortable asking their, their questions verbally, uh, there's a chat box and you will be free to, 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 to write your, your question in the chat box and Pietro will then respond to all those questions. Over to you, Pietro, and welcome once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Saul. I'm, I'm happy you organized this in a very short amount of time. And um, I like, uh, you know, to have this opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, talk about editing because I, um, I, I fell in love with this uh, art form many years ago. Uh, I, um, you know, I grew up in Switzerland. I loved cinema. I went and studied to, uh, went to the United States to study film uh, on a scholarship from Switzerland. I wanted to be a director, writer, cameraman. Editing was not on the horizon when I studied, but I started um, working on uh, documentaries and I was always interested in films that uh, had some kind of social realism to it. I mean, I was influenced obviously by the Italian neorealist films, but that's the, the, the films that, I, uh, that appeal to me. I discovered editing uh, when working with my hands uh, on, on the documentaries and realized very early on how powerful a tool it is and um, in, in storytelling and how specific it is to, uh, um, to, uh, to film and cinema in that form. Um, I was uh, fortunate and somehow I, I found uh, myself that I'm, 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 I'm good at it. I enjoyed working with my hands and uh, lend itself to, uh, to, to uh, you know, make my films. And then later on uh, starting my career with like directors as uh, was mentioned before with Oliver Stone. But one of the things that um, I discovered over the years is that um, a lot of people really don't know what editing is or they've heard about it uh, in some form or another. Um, for many years, even uh, my mother, you know, was curious of exactly what I do. He said, well, what is it? I mean, you just, you know, cut the head and tails. I mean, it, what is, it's not so difficult, you know, I guess to put, you know, pieces together. Um, so the, the, the fact is that uh, not many people really know uh, what is involved uh, unless you are in a cutting room, unless you experience it. Um, most people think, oh, you eliminate all the, the bad stuff, okay? Or somebody 
uh, tells you uh, what is, what is good or how to put it together. I it, it's not like that at all. Uh, it is uh, the 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 editor in film is a is one of the the key positions uh, for the, the the film to be in uh, on the same level as a, as a writer, a production designer, or a cinematographer. However, it's also the most the closest relationship to the director in terms of uh, shaping and rewriting the film. As they say, the film is done, you know, three times uh, when it is written, the second time when it's shot, and the last and final time and the final rewrite is really the editing. The power of editing allows you to use the material uh, in such a way that uh, you are able to in the best way convey you know the drama the human uh, emotions and uh, in a coherent uh, fashion um, it's it's based on a lot of uh, obviously technical aspects of it and you know um, in terms of what you, you come very early to realize by actually doing what what makes sense or what doesn't uh, in, in, in in combining certain shots depending on size on movement on on, on uh, um, performance but it's uh, it's really uh, a editing a language that evolved as the, the as, as movies were evolving a lot of the techniques uh, have been done there's nothing really new nowadays I mean even the, though the, the technology has changed, the language, you know, evolved from the silent area, from the time, you know, even the first uh, cameraman, you know, um, Potter uh, decided to to go in for a close up. Initially, everything was like in a kind of proscenium uh, form, you know, just static. It was just a, a photographic reproduction of, of of a play. The close up uh, changed that, and with that also the the uh, continuity of time uh, the the the, uh, the the placement of, of time or, or also the uh, techniques evolved in in storytelling in terms of like things that happened before or things that could happen things that somebody might imagine so various techniques uh, were developed very very early on and I think the language the beauty of, of cinema is that it can it's still evolving as a language new new technology allows us to um, to communicate differently we also notice that uh, the, uh, innovative financial products and uh, you, you know taking advantage of different sorry, technology. i'm not sure who's talking and <laughs> okay sorry uh, randani mute yourself yeah um so uh, i was saying that uh, the uh, also the speed of uh of how information, how, how images and, and audio is being absorbed is, is getting faster and faster. And I think that uh, we can see it nowadays, even with social media technology, that people are very savvy in how, uh, you know, how to communicate uh, visually and with audio. Uh, and it becomes faster and faster. We are continuously bombarded by uh, information all the time. And you can see that uh, certain styles and techniques uh, are be become cliches in, in, in how we, we tell stories or how we uh, you know present certain certain shows. However, if we talk specifically for myself about this conversation, it's for me to give uh, uh, you know the, the listeners here and, and people who are who tuned in a, a little bit of a view behind the, the 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 curtain, so to speak, of what I actually do because. Not many people get get to see that. Um, it is uh, the cutting room uh, for many directors is a they call like a sacred place. It's it's a safe place where a lot of time the the filmmaker himself is vulnerable uh, when presented with the material um, uh, that he has shot. It is not a given uh, that what was shot or what was performed automatically is obvious. What ends ends up um, in the final film. You might have an idea, you might have some inclination of what, how to build, how to structure a certain scene, but ultimately you're faced with the actual material that was done at that, at that day and shot. And uh, you, uh, 
you come to realize very early on that there's infinite possibilities also to put something together, but it's always about making certain choices. And so for, for, for a, an editor, as a collaborator to the director, it's about initially making that choice. I separate myself. I mean, I read the script. You know, uh, usually an editor starts a few weeks before uh, the, the production starts filming. I receive the material day by day. I build it, I mean, review it sometimes with the director. We talk about it, not, not really necessarily taking notes about what it's like or not like, but the editor uh, in that phase of, uh, of uh, photography literally is building the film, getting the material, organizing it, selecting it, and building the scene as the material comes in. It's not necessarily shot in order, things change, uh, but uh, the editor uh, works right behind the camera in building what has been shot. Stay, staying very close to the script, the director's intentions and choices. Um, so I would say sometimes like a week or two after principal photography, um, the director, uh, I mean, the editor uh, presents the director and only to the director a so-called uh, editor's uh, pass. Some people call it the first assembly, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this rough cut. It, it really is not a film at that point. It's just a series of, of, uh, of uh, scenes um, and, and, and sequences structured together that somewhat reflect as good as possible the, the script that was written with some deletions or additions and so forth. With um, with digital, I mean, with movies that have a lot of digital effects and uh, visual effects um, nowadays, a lot of times you end up with really temporary shots, like with green screen or or a storyboard just filled in. The uh, after the shooting, the second phase starts, and that is usually uh, so called the, uh, the the director's cut phase. Um, contractually, a director from the United States and DGA has a ten week period to actually do his cut. And that is the period, the second phase, where you do work really intensely and you actually make the film. That means by removing things that you don't think are necessary, or removing uh, re re repetitions from beginning to end. Not every scene has to have uh, the, the, uh, you know, somebody walking into the scene and leaving the scene. Uh, sometimes you decide that you want to go at this point. You, you, you bridge scenes by themes and thoughts. So you, you shape it. It's, it's the shaping and structuring and making of the film. After, towards the end of the second stage, the director then presents the film to, you know, close colleagues, to friends, to producers, and has to present it to, uh, to the studio, uh, which, at which stage the studio uh, and the, uh, really comes in and has, has their own uh, input about it. They like, they don't like, does it work, doesn't work. And that is followed usually by, in, in Hollywood, in this particular case, it's much different with smaller films or independent films in Europe, even in the United States. But most people will present, put this cut, so this called director's cut or combination with the studio cut in front of an audience uh, as for a preview uh, to get feedback. Does it work? Does it not work? And that is a completely different stage. At this stage, everybody becomes an editor. Everybody knows, you know, in terms of like, oh, we move this and that, you know? And uh, it's, uh, it's, there are, it's tough to navigate those waters, both on a uh, artistic, uh, but also on, on a political level, because there's a lot of influence specifically on, on uh, big budget movies to, to make the movie as successful as possible and you know to reach a wide audience, um, and so let's say if things go well, previous goes well, the last stage really then becomes the finishing aspect of it, which is uh, you know uh, turning over to uh, composers, uh, the the scenes, the uh, spotting with composers, the uh, and also with the sound designers, with the visual effects. I mean, it, it works all along, but really this is when you get into the last stage of finishing the film. Uh, you know, doing your pre-dubs, mixing and color correction, timing and all like that. So for me, these process of a movie 
lasts from you know nine to twelve months from beginning to end. But um, as I said before, I'm interested in um, in telling you more about you know specific about films. This was a little bit general view of, of my my work, but more uh, about uh, what my relationships are with um, with the directors and. As you can see, uh, it is an, a close relationship. It is almost like a, like a marriage. You have to get along. It is not uh, I believe that uh, an editor is simply a an executor of uh, uh, of the director's um, choices. He is, in a sense. I mean, you you obviously the, you, you you try to fulfill or complete the director's vision, but a good editor, in my opinion, is somebody that also challenges the director in, in, in ways to look at things differently. There is a dialogue that needs to be created and uh, you have to feel comfortable uh, in the environment. Uh, uh, obviously, you have to get along or at least have some uh, equal tastes, but it's really based on, on trust. And so if my relationships with the Directors that I've worked with. I'm not sure who that is, but anyway, it's it's based on trust and um, you know trying to um, make the best film that we can. So uh, I, we mentioned the films that we want to talk about. Obviously, they were very I'm very proud of those films. Uh, but if you want, so we can. Turn it over. Maybe there's somebody that has a specific questions about those films, and I'm happy to answer. Um, I, I want to do that. I'll abuse my position and ask you, since we are in Africa, that you tell us a bit about Black Hawk Down. Yeah, somebody oh, sorry, might need to turn out sorry, the, the sorry. microphone. Nomonde. Uh, Nomonde, please mute yourself. Okay. All right, so um, Black Hawk Down, Black Hawk Down actually uh, <clears throat> uh, happened uh, 20 years ago. I mean, it's unbelievable how long ago that, that is when you think about it, you know, it seems like yesterday, but Black Hawk Down, I told you this briefly, uh, uh, you know, was uh, when, when, when Ridley Scott uh, presented me the idea uh, that he was, that was gonna be his next film, um, he, he handed me the book um, and um, I, I read it and as well as this, 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 the book was very informative and I got a really good sense uh, of what happened. I knew obviously of the, uh, what happened in 93 in, in Somalia because the, the images of the, uh, uh, the, the soldiers, you know, being dragged through the city was, uh, quite uh, shocking you know it, it was one of those things where images that you hadn't or the American public hadn't seen um, since the Vietnam War and it was also uh, many not many people even knew that Americans were in Somalia at that in any case uh, when when I got the script uh, it was a condensed version of, of the book uh, it was it was a good script but uh, it became very apparent that there were a lot of uh, characters. And it wasn't necessarily, wasn't following tra a traditional uh, script or structure uh, with um, with the characters. And so when I started working on it, uh, one of the difficulties was to keep track of who all they were based on the names, but also because I would get the material and, you know, I didn't know, uh, you know, their, their faces. They pretty much looked all alike, you know, 20 year old young guys with shaved heads, you know, and, and specifically if they have helmets on. And that was also uh, a problem with Ridley Scott. So he at one point decided to put their names on their helmet, which is not authentic to the, the soldiers didn't do that, but it, it did help Ridley Scott. And it helped me to take pictures of, of each of these uh, characters and, and soldiers and put them up on the, on the wall in my cutting room. Um, it was an unusual uh, way to, uh, to do this, uh, uh, for Ridley Scott to do this film. And very early on, he decided that because it's re there's really complex uh, action, uh, that uh, he would shoot everything with multiple cameras. 
or long, long takes with multiple cameras, um, as opposed to, you know, breaking down the action uh, into smaller pieces and then building it together. So what would happen is, is that he would place sometimes even up to 11 cameras. That includes, you know, A unit, B unit, steady cam unit, crash cameras, helicopter cameras, uh, you know, uh, splinter units, as many cameras as possible he could do, place them in different uh, uh, places in the, uh, in the theater where the action would take place from the air, from the ground, from where the explosion would happen. And it didn't matter if sometimes you would have a steady cam operator or a camera crew fall into the shot because it would be only a, for a section. And so I would end up with, and, and by the way, the other thing is he would shoot very long takes. That means, you know, a whole roll of film, which basically is about, uh, you know, uh, eight minutes of, uh, you know, of continuous take of action of long take. So he also ended up doing very few takes of uh, of that during the day because he, they could only maybe do two or three setups a day. So the idea was to capture the action and the events from every possible angle uh, and just give me the material so that I could then go and you know choose. Now it's a nightmare. Just imagine the amount of material I would get uh, that I have to go through it to select. If you have, you know, 10 cameras, six cameras or 11 cameras times eight minutes, you know, that's uh, 90 minutes, uh, an hour and a half for one take that I have to look at it. So I would spend hours and hours looking at it. Sometimes I would link them together to be able to see from different angles. Um, and yes, I have it from all possible angles, but you, you talked earlier about African time. Well, uh, it's all, editing is all about timing. However, the timing, real time, and capturing everything at the same time is not the same thing as movie time. Movie time is built from one time, it continues, right? But it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I can't show, uh, everything at the same time. I can only show one thing after the other and pretend it happens at the same time. So uh, the way best to explain it is that even though I would have the action and let's say I have action A happening here, action B happening somewhere else, action C uh, happen happening in another part and D somewhere else, all these four different actions were shot at the same time. So sometime the time would, would overlap and I would find myself in trouble in how to break apart this time, the movie time in order to build it up again. You, 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 does that make sense? Uh, so I was continuously struggling with that, that I could not find solutions to, 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 to do this. Besides uh, uh, the, the additional uh, difficulty was to not just follow, oh, I'm just gonna pretend uh, like in, in movie terms that uh, this action, this explosion, this helicopter happens like this and show, you know, the, how the war uh, or this battle uh, in, in Mogadishu happened. Um, and that still at the same time follow groups of characters because there wasn't really one main character. I mean, there was one, but it wasn't, in, like I said before, in the classical narrative. So you're following these different characters, these different actions, and where, decide where to be at what time. For me, it became very essential that I had to be very specific with time and geography as well to understand for myself uh, where everybody was. So it was not, not easy to, uh, from having read the book, seeing, uh, reading the characters to actually building it together. And I briefly mentioned to you when we last uh, uh, spoke about Black Hawk Down that I hated that film as I was working through. I was suffering. I really, really did not enjoy the process. It was very similar uh, process as, uh, as in JFK because it, it does have a documentary feel to it capture real time at, at the moment in, in, in urban warfare. It didn't have a fake uh, Hollywood construction to it. But the, the, the fact that I had to be specific in terms of 
action uh, and and where the action happened geographically was to help the viewer just as myself to understand the the, the consequences of the action in, in cause and effect if this happens and that happens what was happening somewhere else so i was always dealing with uh, with um with those aspects of uh, you know of time i guess and uh, and geography um what happened uh is that uh, you get a sense of i mean or or a, a sense of being uh, in the in the in the soldiers feet and experiencing even though you might know or read about the ultimate outcome of the of the of the of Mogadish and and and, and how those soldiers died and what happened during that night during that day when they're out there you still experience the film as a first person in a sense you get to feel um what the soldiers must have felt if you're being shot at i want to tell you a little bit uh, if people know the film of a, of a, a sequence uh in the movie where the helicopters uh for the first time do an incursion into mogadishu they leave the base, they go down the coast, and there are the, some, some militia already see them leaving. They, they, they alert, uh, a little kid alerts the militia, hey, the helicopters have left the base, they're coming down the coast and so forth. Uh, so that, that sequence over the, uh, the, the coast and coming the first uh, incursion into uh, Mogadishu, by the way, we shot the film in, in Morocco, in Rabat, and used Saleh, which is the sister city of Rabat in Morocco, as uh, the set for, uh, for Mogadishu. Uh, similar thing, idea with the, 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 the sea and the coastline. Um, when we uh, started production on Black Hawk Down, it was not uh, given that, we, that Ridley Scott would be given Black Hawks to actually film in Morocco, because these were actual weapons and helicopters that had to come with US military. But uh, Ridley Scott helped through the help of the, the king uh, managed and the, 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 the State Department managed to get the Blackhawks into the country and also the four little helicopters called Little Birds into the country for a period of two weeks with the whole personnel. So we, we shot for literally, I think 14 to 16 weeks, but during that time, only two weeks were with helicopters. And so, it was a very concentrated time to do all the helicopter shots. And um, one time um, I, I was putting together uh, the material and selecting the helicopter shots. And in particular, that sequence, the incursion into Mogadishu um, with the helicopters, obviously there was no, uh, there's no sound. It was just images, but they were beautiful images. And one of the things that really appealed to me was the idea that had the helicopter to helicopter shots, which is uh, had a, a nice flow to it. Also, the the slow motion and the speed differences that created this uh, amazing uh, choreography and ballet of, of the shots. It, it was uh, reminiscent of uh, you know of uh, Apocalypse Now with the helicopters, you know, and the Valkyr uh, plane coming into uh, Vietnam. But obviously, we say like we we had to uh, you know do our own thing but I, I i put it together visually as a selection not worrying about <clears throat> sound the specific sound of the helicopter and i put it together with a piece of music <clears throat> that uh, that was from a science fiction film and the reason was because when i looked at those black helicopters over the ocean uh, flying into mogadishu it reminded me of aliens or, or alien crafts invading a land. They looked, they looked like um, over the ocean that with a tail and everything. They almost looked like whales uh, or you know fish. I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but there was a, a particular piece of track from uh, the film Fifth Element that to me uh, somehow I remember it had these uh, whale type of sounds, kind of like thing, uh, very, very science fiction like. And at the same, it had uh, a, a whoosh uh, repetitive sound that would go like <laughs> rhythmically, just musically. And I put it together and I said, just, I, I just want to just for me to, to have it. It was not intended really to be used like that, but 
it created a nice effect. And um, Ridley uh, called me one day and said, listen, the, the, the pilots and the team are leaving uh, uh, Rabat and uh, they, they would like to come into the cutting room and uh, can you show him some of the footage you know, that, that they shot? They're really curious to see what it looks like. So I did uh, invite them in. They came in, uh, the pilots, the co-pilots, the uh, technical advisors, the military. I had probably like about eight to 10 people in my cutting room and I was showing them this, my selected sequence of this footage of the different helicopters and so forth that I put together. It was probably maybe like about seven minutes long. And it was just that, images to show them with the music. And um, the, they were very, very happy uh, to see it. But one of the, one of the, uh, one of the pilots said, oh, that's, that's amazing. I, I can't believe it. I mean, I just got goosebumps. Uh, and it was uh, the, the, uh, the idea that uh, without hearing the, actually the sound of the helicopters for, for, the, for the, uh, the soldiers, you know, being inside the helicopter before engaging into a battle, it, it feels like that, it, 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 it is internalized. The, the sounds are muted, it's, it's quiet. It's not, it's not aggressive at all. So I, I, I knew that I, I was onto something, that the, the tone and, and the feel was right. And later on, uh, Hans Zimmer did a similar piece of music uh, to it, but we went with that idea to not put all the helicopter sounds, to play it silent, to make it more uh, muted and uh, and um, and uh, you know just mixed it that way. So that was a way to uh, to again uh, uh, show an example how editing is really about conveying specific emotions, the, the right emotions to put the viewer in experiencing what either your main character or uh, the characters experience. Okay, um, let me acknowledge the presence of Shane Maja. He's an accomplished filmmaker and also a chief director in the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture in, in Gauteng. Uh, colleagues, let me open the floor if there's anyone who has a question so that I don't have to, to abuse my, my, my position. Uh, where I have to ask all the questions. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, if a person is asking a question, you can also raise your hand, then we will know that immediately after that person, you will pop in to ask your question too. Any, any brave person out there? Um, so, go ahead. Oh, Naya. So, Nyana, how are you? Fine, and how are you? This is Mukoni Nyana Muleti. He an accomplished filmmaker and broadcaster who was with our public broadcaster for, for many, many years. Over to you, my chief. Hi. Hi, Pietro. Yes. In, in the example that you 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 refer to with um, muting the helicopter sounds um, and one one soldier got goosebumps what if um, what would have happened if you were asked by four or two of them where where the sound was why aren't you using the helicopter sound what would that, what would have been my answer yeah. I would have said, uh, well, this is not really the, the final thing, uh, you know, that we, we do, even in the mix stage, we do explore diff different ways of, do, uh, of, of going about it. But it was one of those things that when you, when you find something that moves you emotionally and that it feels right, you know, you, you recognize it. And as, a, as, a, as, an, as an editor or as a filmmaker, you know, I am inspired by the material that is in front of me. And I don't know where inspiration comes from in terms of sound. It, it's sometimes it's, it's, it's a weird thing. Uh, you know, just the, the fact that I was putting it together and listened to that music and put it together to present with 
to with 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 the soldiers uh it had i don't know it just it was one of those things that happened if they would have said you know <laughs> if they would have said well what is the helicopter sound really it's 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 not really doesn't really matter you know it's up to the director i mean if you would have said hey if, if the studio head or somebody else said where is the, the this is well we don't like it we want it like this it's not it's a choice it's a choice of you know a creative uh choice and and, and taste um so it uh you know i mean one time and it also the thing is is that when you have for example without any sp making any specific names or, or movies but for example if an actor a lot of times when we when we we get in the final stages we do what is called adr automatic dialogue replacement we we do replace uh the dialogue um the audio if it is problematic or uh, something something is wrong so we we present uh, we usually don't show actors the film until it's it's released. Uh, they also actors are not allowed to come into the cutting room. Um, the, even even stars are not allowed to come into the cutting. Room. They can see the director can show the film when it's done. But during the ADR stage, this uh, dubbing, as it is also called, where the actor comes in, watches the scene, and and replaces the dialogue, there were some instances where uh, one actor said, uh, "Well, I don't like that take." <laughs> it's, it's like. You know what do you do? He says, "Oh, I'm sorry, you don't like it, but uh, you know, the director and I like it." He says, "You know why?" He says, "Well, you see that there, that 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 stumble, that thing is. I, I don't like that." He said, "No, that's the reason we like it. You know, that's exactly why we like it. You know, and and it it becomes to that. It's not. Uh, it's about choice because, you know, the actor might come from a different uh, perspective and see, and he, and he feels that it's a fault if if he stuttered." Or hesitated in that line the way it presented. I said, "No, that's actually the real part of it. It's not fake. It is good. It is, it is. It wasn't thought out. It, it, it is natural. So the choices uh, we make is to uh, make not to be mean or uh, disrespectful, but there is a director, and that, that's a choice he makes. And 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 a lot of times, we go for I, I personally on on on, on uh, aesthetic grounds go for the things that are not so called perfect." I go for what is real, and 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 as a viewer, the only uh, me that I have is my first interaction with the material, and I do uh, uh, for myself uh, note why I feel a certain way. Why does an image, you know, make me feel in a certain way? It's not a given. I mean, I want to give you an example, which is uh, really good about why making certain choices as as an editor. In Gladiator, this is a classic thing, is I've spoken about it uh, many times, but to show that how editing is really writing. The beginning of Gladiator is a, a hand over wheat before the movie actually starts. And when I started the film, I mean, I like the idea of, start, of starting something not in, in the usual way, even though Gladiator is, was a commercial and classical film in its story. Uh, about the, you know, hero and Roman times and forth. I always look for the more poetic side of images. Well, the the script in the movie started as Ridley uh, intended to uh, to start on a big close up of uh, Russell Crowe. Big close up. That's the first image you see, uh, and then expand, and you see that he's standing in the middle of a burned out battlefield, waiting for the battle to happen. Now, it's a great way to start a film like that. It's a great way to immediately show, I mean, a beautiful close-up, that your main character deep in thought. It's a great way for a, for, a, for, a, for a viewer, for an audience to immediately identify, oh, this is the guy I'm going, going to follow, right? Great. As the movie was shot, and the interesting thing that the Gladiator was one of the only movies that was shot in chronological order, simply because of uh, the way of production happened. But at the end of the shoot, the uh, second unit shot this, these images. They were shot uh, in, in Italy, in Tuscany, which were images of the hand over the wheat, uh, the, uh, the, the, the main character, Maximus, returning to his farmland, uh, you know, the family, the home. These were images that were intended for his death, uh, for the 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 the, uh, the afterlife, and how he he imagined Elysium, 
And uh, so, but I saw this image of the hand over the wheat, beautiful light uh, and uh, very tactile. It, it, it affected me emotionally. I said, that's a beautiful image. Now, just thinking over, the, 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 thing, the thing is thinking back of the films I've done, the first, you're, when you watch a movie, the first opening shot, that always brilliant. It's a, it's, it's a promise of something to come. You're there, you're ready to watch it. So filmmakers know how you open a film is, is great. It's, 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 it's very, very powerful. So I said, you know, also at the same time, I wanted to, uh, it, it's, the, the first image is uh, the so-called, it's, it's a virgin image. It has nothing that precedes it. It has no context. Only the second image has uh, uh, cr creates context with what what follows. So I felt that by why not use this image of the hand over the wheat to uh, to be the first one before the close up because of this because that particular image, regardless of what it is of what the movie is going to be. Just like I reacted to it, the viewer will react as well uh, in their own way. It doesn't matter that it's the same feeling as I have, but that image will be, will be theirs. They can feel whatever they want to feel and they, they don't know, it doesn't matter, but it does have a feeling to it. It's just like a sound that has a certain quality to it. That visual has a certain feel to it. So that is your image. Only after you see the second shot, do you put that image in context? And you all of a sudden realize, oh, maybe this person is uh, thinking about that. Maybe it's a desire. Maybe it's, 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 it's the past. Maybe it's a dream. It doesn't matter. You get to realize what that image is. But most of all, you already created the context of that. And that image will, will return. Uh, but what happened this is exactly the ed that's exactly editing. This is what editing is, is truly about. That with within one cut, I was able, and I'm really proud of that, to be able to create the whole con uh, the whole thematic of what the film is about in Gladiator. That it was a that it was a of course a, a, the, the story of a hero and all that, but any hero story is a story of a transcendence to move from one stage of, uh, of, of and, and and moving. Uh, into another stage of, 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 of being human in that process of the hero sacrifices himself for the good of, of society, right? But any form of transformation or transcendence is an internal one. So my storytelling aspect of it and what I contribute is that this story, we're gonna tell from the inside out, not from the outside looking um, at the hero. This You have to feel it. It's the same process as, the soldiers in Black Hawk Down. It's the same thing that to me as an editor, the movie starts always with, with character to, 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 to put the viewer to understand the character, to experience the story through character. It's always character first. It's character, story second, and structure last. That's, that's how the, the, the movies that, that I build. And so again, just the, the simple reaction or uh, in, in, uh, impression of one image managed for me to clarify and solidify and, and uh, crystallize the, the thematic of the film with one cut. And it, and it, it does work. It, it works throughout the, the thing because people at the end realize, you know, what the, this image means and so forth. So anyway, that is, a, that is a, uh, uh, what an editor does. It's not, it's not written in the script. It was not uh, chosen by the director when he shot it. It was simply an image of many images put at a specific point that uh, you know created the rest of it. So that's a, a simple yet uh, I think you know effective move and 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 the power of editing, as I mentioned earlier. Anyway, long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, th thank you very much. Um... You're welcome. Okay. No, um, thank you so much. Um, my my invites went to people involved in in all the value chains in the film industry. 
um, starting even with with catering, and I see this uh, Makatisha Mutsipe, who is a chef. She has joined us. I've also realized there's Princess Maja just involved in infrastructure development. But let me also uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of Moraka Vesiakwa Brarax, who is involved in in the South African Literary Awards, a, a veteran of our cultural struggles, and also yeah. an ex robin Islander. Um, may I take one last question before we move to the closing remarks by Abdul Mohali, the president of the National Writers Association of South Africa? Uh, maybe even I may even hijack Shane, uh, even though uh, I'm still going to engage with him up after this session. Uh, maybe he may also chip in to say a few words. Shane, or any question? Okay, to save time, Pietro, please tell us about your impression of, of South Africa, because it's for the first time you are visiting our country, but also to say the few words, uh, days that I spent with you, um, I, 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 you have just given me a totally, totally different perspective to what I thought Hollywood was all about, particularly your own personality. And that's why yesterday I even said, you are an excellent host when you were saying that I, I was a very, uh, sorry, a, an excellent guest when, when you were saying I was a very good host, uh, responding to what Taviso Kotane on Power FM, uh, said about yes. me when he was uh, interviewing you. So um, give us your, your, your impressions of South Africa so far and your visit uh, to yes. up, up until today. Well, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, Roberto Maioli uh, asked me to come here. It's my first time. I've been wanting to come to Africa for, for a long time. I know this is South Africa. We'll see other parts of Africa as well, but, um, I um, just want to say that I was all proud to uh, to to meet uh, several people here uh, and also be like educated about the history. I mean, in in a in a more physical way. It's a completely uh, for me the experience of being on uh, you know in uh, on Constitution uh, Hill uh, and uh, visiting Soweto that read and heard for so long but actually walking through it had a very uh, strong impact on me i i uh, I, um, I really um will have great memories of that the, the thing is it's very hard for where for me uh, to really get a in this short amount of time a great a good sense of the the whole city but i got to experience different neighborhoods uh i can see still the uh, the, the 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 separation of wealth i mean it, it just uh, it, it's it's uh, it is as big as Los Angeles. It has the same climate. It's 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 wonderful to be here. But it's it's getting a sense uh, of the the city itself and the pulse. It's taking me a little bit more time. Uh, it's not immediate. And uh, I, um, I, uh, I I will take with me the one thing. I mean, now with with the curfew, uh, it, it's really hard to you know, feel like rushed when you, we go out to dinner. Uh, there's always been conversations about safety and so forth. The, I, the, the one thing I will take with me, not as, as a criticism, but I, I just the, 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 the high walls and, and the electric fences, that's uh, something that uh, I, I have a hard time uh, understanding how people live because you don't really see behind it. I, I like the interaction with people. It's been a great uh, pleasure meeting you and I'm glad you put this together and close me to it, but I, I will definitely have to come back again and, uh, and 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 you know hopefully when COVID is over or just experience more but in general it's been a wonderful wonderful experience and I really want to thank Roberto for uh, inviting me here for this time. 
Okay. Also, just to say that uh, yesterday you had a very fruitful engagement with former president. Uh, oh, yes. Kalema and yes. you also had a private tour of the oh, Nelson yes. Mandela Foundation. Uh, yes, that, that was all the absolutely, you're absolutely right. Sorry for forgetting that. It was a highlight to meet uh, President Motlante. It was very generous. It was great to share with him his love for, for music, uh, you know, and uh, jazz. Uh, and I told him I love music and I like African music and um, talked about uh, Masakela. Uh, and um, also, the uh, we were allowed to see the um, uh, the um, Mandela Foundation with a with a private tour, and that was a, a highlight to 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 you know to be there and see see Mandela's uh, personal artifact and and, and um, environment. Um, so it, it, it's it's the people. Here have been very, very generous uh, with their time, and I found them extremely, everybody extremely uh, wonderful and, and, and gracious uh, in, in accepting me here uh, during this time. So thank you, uh, Saul, for that. Okay. And you in particular, uh, you, you, uh, you've been amazing. Thank you. Okay. Comrade Trax, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Sol and uh, El Pietro. Welcome, welcome to our country. Thank um, you. I just wanted to, um, I know we are, we are drawing towards a close, but I just wanted to um, ask you, Pietro, uh, now going forward in the filming, in your space of filmmaking, uh, the challenges of now, uh, the COVID period, when it comes, for instance, to I don't know to what extent you are you are involved with uh, choosing actors and stuff like that. Um, the challenges that uh, are sprung up by by COVID in terms of choices of who you take uh, um, before it, it was simple. You didn't have to think about the, whether a person is vaccinated or not. Now those kind of things, um, you know, the ease or or the difficulties of, of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, the thing is with um, with anything in in the future. Obviously, uh, I I am fortunate that uh, you know I have good relationships and I have the luxury to to choose uh, projects, and I do uh, try to choose them in things where you know I would be. Engage for an hour and 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 and, and on a subject that uh, that I uh, uh, you know uh, dig uh, my uh, teeth in and and and, and enjoy um, the so it's it's always about selecting uh, the material obviously and but I I discovered this past year uh, with with the pandemic that uh, I was able to to work from home remotely uh, and. Uh, that was uh, with the technology that we have now uh, with uh, uh, people working remotely for example we have a, a, a the cutting rooms in in uh, in the studio or in, in a room with the server and all the media but we can connect with uh, different apps uh, almost uh, from home with a separate satellite machine and i can without having all the media at my house we can all access the same uh, material uh, remotely. And it, I have to tell you that that was one of the great uh, discoveries that uh, I did enjoy working from home. Um, also, uh, I didn't think I would because you have to be you know, with, uh, with people together and making choices and with the director. But uh, it allowed me to, to work at a different rhythm in a sense and also be able to cook for myself, to eat. Uh, there's the danger, and obviously, because that the guy, fact that you, the you son have of the guy who bought that building on behalf of. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just saying that uh, with having a machine at home, you work all the time. And I had to learn to, uh, you know, compartmentalize the time uh, to, to, uh, to work on it because you, I, have, I put a, a studio in the house, but the machine is always there. And with editing, you can work continuously. So, and end up working even long hours. For me, the hours 
in general would be like, you know, I work 10 to 12 hours a day. So sometimes at, at home, you know, I would spread up in, the, uh, in a different time. It didn't have to be continuous. Uh, the director I was working uh, with the last picture also had to move back to Sweden. So times were different. But uh, I, I have to say that uh, the technology and, and COVID allowed for people to do to work differently from home. And it, it's changed not only in the film industry, specifically for editing, uh, but uh, for a lot of other industries. For example, if I uh, get hired to do a film that is being shot on location, some directors might request uh, to, to be present during the filming, but it's not necessarily, it's not essential. If, if I need to go to Europe, uh, I, I will make that choice. But I think I find myself, and for the future project, try to find a, uh, a project that uh, keeps me uh, at home uh, as much as, as possible. I, the, the fact of living in Los Angeles, it really uh, allows me to not lose, you know, an hour, an hour and a half of, uh, you know, traffic and, and uh, driving every day. So mm -hmm. I use that time <laughs> for other things and and have a, a more uh, a different lifestyle. So I uh, I like the changes that uh, COVID brought, specifically in my profession. Thank you, okay. Nana. Yeah, thank you. Look. Um... I, I hear you say that um, you you'd like to come back, and I'm yes. wondering if in your when you return, um, it would be great to organize some kind of a workshop um, with uh, with film um, makers here or, yes. or with with film practitioners, so yes. so so that. Um, you can share your 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 expertise um, in a in a kind of workshop uh, environment, and if that yeah. uh, can happen, uh, yes. so I would like to be part of it. Okay, no, I would love to do that. I uh, I I uh, have done that before. I've done it at UCLA uh, and uh, with with students, and and I. I enjoy uh, the, the aspect of it of telling students because when I remember when I was a student and any little bits of pieces of experience of really what it is out in the real world rather than in an academic world or in a, like when you when you start off uh, is uh, is very um, very helpful. So I, I like to be able to give back and um, and and you know and and do things like that. I I enjoy it. I enjoy. Um, I enjoy, like I said, my uh, my craft or art, and uh, I would like for people to uh, to discover it as well and um, share my experiences with them. So yes, absolutely open to it. Yeah, in fact, that was the the our purpose for reaching out to the Houghton Sports Arts and Culture and the Houghton Film Commission. And we have also reached out to the National Film and Video Foundation, and we have also engaged with um, particularly your Black filmmakers uh, through their Film Forum uh, WhatsApp. That uh, yes. we, we, I think, will be engaging with with Shane post this event, so that then uh, it could also be in his in his plan for for the immediate future that yeah, sure. um, yeah that i was going to say that it also works excuse we'll me have, also when i have the uh this workshop i think in the interest of time i'm now going to ask abdul mohali to give us the closing remarks and my sincerest apologies to to those colleagues i i haven't acknowledged uh trust me I was just guided by the names that the few names that popped up on my my screen, but I do appreciate your presence and wait and enough uh, to express how grateful I am that you made time to to join us, uh, Comrade President. Uh, over to you. Uh, unmute, you. please. Okay. Uh, I thank, see. Thank you, Brasson. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and some people may not know that you are also a member of uh, 
the executive uh, of MASA, the National Writers Association, uh, responsible for our, our democracy and, and our spokesperson. Now, uh, I want to thank you very much for such a compressed yet detailed uh, journey in the making of a film. This takes me back a few years ago when I was uh, uh, involved with a film called The Lord Lady by Zakaria Rafuna, which was shot over two weeks, only to produce a 15 minutes uh, film, a short film for the uh, awards. So I, I, I sort of, you know, uh, Remember uh, when you said the film can take uh, over over here to make uh, just to make a, a forty-five minutes film, uh, and I, I, I understand it, which is what yeah, most right. people not uh, don't realize uh, when when we go into the studio. I will suggest, uh, and I will only engage with Saul. But uh, we should engage you as uh, as NASA. Uh, to create some relationship with the the, the, the institutes that we are, we are trying to establish, we are working to establish for uh, the creative writers uh, as, 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 as NASA and see how we can collaborate in, in, in that space. You know, because I know that in, at the university level, you go there after, you know, satisfying certain criteria and whatever, but there are a lot of people that do not satisfy those criteria, but they are creative and our institute uh, much more looks at trying to, uh, you know, to bridge the gap and bring particularly the richness of the story of South Africa. The African continent as, as, as we are. But most importantly, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us. Uh, many people at your uh, at level would not you know, share this time unless it comes to some consummate payment, uh, as if it is a you know, it's a privilege that you can take to a grave, uh, so to speak. But the work that you have done with us here uh, will go a long way, uh, I think, with, uh, you know, the audience that, that is here. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And I hope that I'm also speaking for the audience that uh, we thank you abundantly. I also want to thank the audience uh, that's you know that is here uh, and for your time. I mean, people like Alex, Nyana, you know, people that are very uh, uh, busy. Uh, you know, I see we had it there as well. It was not such a big audience, but I think quality of the audience that is here uh, uh, is is the audience that uh, will take us forward as a as a as a creative industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, so. Thank you very much. Uh, cheers, everyone. Cheers. Till next time. Cheers, cheers, comrades. Bye, bye, everybody. Shall we say go well, everyone? Right, say. Bye, bye. <laughs> bye, -bye. Uh,